Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I wanna thank you for listening. I wanna ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you're gonna find a link to subscribe directly to Act and Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts, so as more people then will be able to find our show. I'm joined today by Noah Gould, Acton's alumni and student programs manager. And this week we're joined by a special guest, Marvin Alasky. Marvin is an Acton Institute affiliate scholar and a Discovery Institute senior fellow. Among his 29 books are Prodigal Press, The Tragedy of American Compassion, Fighting for Liberty and Virtue, Compassionate Conservatism, Reforming Journalism, Lament for a Father, and The Story of Abortion in America. He has written 5,000 articles for World Magazine and other publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. He is the author of the essay, The Legacy of Compassionate Conservatism, which is a feature essay in the fall issue of Religion and Liberty, which will be on newsstands at Barnes and Noble and Books a Million stores soon, and is published online today at acton.org. This week, we'll be discussing a proposal from Senator Josh Hawley to cap credit card interest rates and a Canadian study on cash transfers that many people are taking lessons from that the study doesn't really seem to show. But first, we want to start with this essay from uh, Marvin Alasky, um, actually titled The Thrill and Chill of Compassionate Conservatism. That's the headline you'll see when you go to acton.org. And uh, Marvin, as you lay out in the beginning of this essay, what we, uh, our editor, Anthony, asked you to do was to take a look back at two of your books, uh, The Tragedy of American Compassion and Compassionate Conservatism, published in 1990 and 1999, respectively. Uh, it says, your brief was to, one, address what I had originally hoped to accomplish with those works, two, discuss whether a compassionate conservatism ever resonated with the American public, three, summarize what has transpired in terms of poverty intervention and amelioration on the federal, state, and local levels, Four, show where we are now. And five, answer the question, is the road ahead now different in some ways from what you outlined in your two books? So why don't we start, Marvin, at the beginning um, in revisiting these two books? What did you find? What did you discover? Among other things that uh, 30 years ago, I used to use the passive too much. Uh, this, is, this is major academic writing, but uh, but but more more serious and severe than that. It was interesting to look back at the 1990s, and at the time, I thought this was a uh, a regular decade, an ordinary decade. Looking back, it seems to be an unusual period in American history where we really didn't have any international challengers. So there was a sense that we had overcome. The Cold War, the Soviet Union had fallen apart, that we could pretty much uh, do what we wanted around the world and do what we wanted at home. The uh, economy generally was, uh, was very good. Uh, we uh, seem to have a peace dividend of sorts. So, hey, now we have the luxury of actually being able to spend some time on compassion, which should not be a luxury, but I think that's... Uh, that's what it now appears to be looking back uh, 30 years later. It was an unusual decade. What do you I mean what do you make today of particularly the effect that com, uh, compa the tragedy of American compassion had on public policy in the 1990s? I mean you have this great anecdote in there where you know kind of unbeknownst to you you are listening to uh, Newt Gingrich speaking from uh, the well of the house and he commends to everybody your book which um, helps to influence some of the actions the Republican Congress took in the 90s in welfare reform um, give us you know one tell us about just that experience from a personal perspective I mean I imagine you have this again you note in the anecdote that someone was supposed to give you a heads up that that was coming and they uh, kind of forgot about it um, I can only imagine what that must have feel like to hear this newly elected speaker of the house recommending your book in in uh, talking before the United States Congress um, 
what what impact did that have on you uh, on the book? And then um, what do we make of those welfare reform efforts that happened in that period of the mid 1990s? First, on the personal side, it uh, somewhat like, let's say, in the 1990s, Michael Jordan uh, suddenly starts talking about some uh, junior high school or high school basketball player and says, oh, this is the greatest player around. Uh, a certain sense of wonder and uh, and weirdness about the whole thing. But uh, yeah, I was I was a professor at the University of Texas. And like uh, many academic writers, you don't expect a whole lot. Uh, coming out of coming out of books, I tried to write it in a way that non-scholarly readers could could enjoy it and understand it. But I didn't expect a whole lot. It had been published for a couple of years. I thought it was pretty much dead in the water. And then through a set of uh, providential circumstances, uh, Bill Bennett reads it, passes it along to Newt, and just as he's becoming Speaker of the House, Republicans taking over the House of Represent- Representatives for the first time in forty years. A lot of cameras, a lot of attention. And he starts talking about this book of mine and keeps talking about it, speech after speech, all through 1995. And uh, Progress and Freedom Foundation, which at that point was uh, was Newt's foundation in many ways, asked me to leave my teaching at the University of Texas and uh, spend a year and a half commuting to Washington and meeting with lots of senators and representatives. This was all new to me. I didn't have any Washington experience, but it was uh, it was fun. Uh, uh, met lots of people, had lots of discussions with various senators and congressmen, uh, did a lot of speechifying in Washington and around the country. And I think one result that came out of it was, well, some education for me, I guess I'm going to talk here about three results, some education and fun for me, some legislation. Congress in 1996 passed a welfare reform bill that Bill Clinton eventually signed into law. And it dealt with the biggest of the 80 or 90 different welfare programs left all the others alone, but made some changes in that program that were that were beneficial, changed it from uh, aid to families with dependent children to TANF, temporary aid to needle to needy families. So it made welfare, that made the largest welfare program temporary, uh, put in some work requirements. All these were useful and it did have an effect on uh, reducing the number of people in that particular program and helping a lot of those people go to work and change their lives and their families' lives. So that was useful. And then I got to be around the country, kind of uh, not Johnny Appleseed, but I suppose Marvin Appleseed, uh, speaking to lots of groups, visiting lots of anti-poverty organizations, and trying to help them see that there was a better way to do it rather than just uh, asking people first, what do you need? The first question to ask really is, what can you do? Uh, What skills do you have? What talents do you have? How can you go from being just a taker to a giver? That went on around the country. There were some programs that changed because of it, some programs that that got their starts. So that was useful. So, uh, yeah, it was an exciting time. How much long-term effect it had, uh, I'm not sure. It did have a long-term effect in some communities that started fighting poverty more effectively. In Washington, the program's except for that one, kept going pretty much as they had gone. And in many ways, as people left that particular program, uh, folks in the social work community helped them get into other government-funded programs. So I'm not sure it had that much of an impact nationally. Yeah, so Marvin, when I hear you speak on this topic, one of the things that jumps out is just your love of a lot of these small little organizations that are super effective and they do really great work kind of on the ground with you know, people and they they know people and they have this relationship with people and that's what, you know, makes them different. And then you have all these stories of you kind of uh, meeting with who's who of, you know, conservatives in the 90s and, and, and talking with a lot of people on this reform. As you, for you personally, how did you kind of square the circle between these big governmental changes that you're making, you know, that you're helping uh, kind of get uh, put through and some of the smaller charities that are you know, kind of on the ground. Yeah, there's really a disconnect in so many ways. One of my favorite people uh, was a woman named uh, Hannah Hawkins, who about three miles southeast of the Capitol ran a program called Children of Mine, an after-school program for kids. And probably about 80 kids on a typical day were there after school. They all knew her. She all knew them. Uh, she was very frank with them. She would say to boys, you know, wash your armpits. And she would say, she would just 
she was just very motherly in, in a in a uh, in a friendly and kind but strict way. Uh, and she was running it on a on a nickel and dime basis, contributions from individuals. She had grown not to trust government money, uh, wasn't much coming anyway because she was uh, a Christian and tried to uh, instill some spiritual concepts in kids as best she could. So here's a terrific person uh, doing this work unheralded, uh, basically doing it on her own with uh, with small contributions. And three miles away at the Capitol, there were all these discussions about a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there. Uh, I went to... Uh, in the Hay Adams Hotel, which is two blocks away from the White House, I was uh, a party favor of sorts at a fifty thousand dollar a plate dinner. Uh, so there was a real disconnect between between the big time politics and these these wonderful folks, even three miles away from the Capitol, like Hannah Hawkins. Let alone people doing wonderful things in Milwaukee and Dallas and all over the place. Just gave me a sense of uh, two Americas in a sense and. The question in my mind was always how you could get resources uh, from the big bucks people in Washington to these small groups all across the country without doing things that would turn them into government lookalikes and, re and, and getting rid of the stuff that really worked. So the particular proposal I really liked in public policy was a proposal for tax credits rather than the people in Washington deciding where the money should go. And rather than having vouchers, even with strings attached, you have to do this and you have to do that. Just a very clear tax credit. You give $500 to the charity of your choice. It can be religious. It can be non-religious. It can be whatever you want. And you can take that off your taxes. So more power, in a sense, for people in their local communities, more ways they can help uh, without, the, uh, without the government deciding what should be done. Uh, there were proposals of that sort that went through Congress. Uh, they never made it for a lot of reasons, uh, and we could get into that. But uh, uh, an education and the little things that you can do successfully around the country and then the big things that just don't get done because there are uh, all sorts of economic reasons why uh, the little people get forgotten. So, yeah, educational all the way around. What did you take away from your experience with that federal kind of legislative process? I mean, I think that probably the best thing that you can say about welfare reform in the 1990s is, as you noted, they did address some of the problems with welfare, or at least with one of the major programs in meaningful ways. I think the general view on the 90s welfare reform, I think, is still pretty positive uh, from a bipartisan perspective. But as you noted, it kind of leaves these 80 to 90 other federal programs untouched. And you recount this story in there of how I believe it was, um, was it in uh, uh, Ohio or Minnesota, where they were you know, once this welfare reform program is enacted, the people on the ground at the state level there are immediately trying to figure out, okay, well, these people who are going to lose benefits from the changes to welfare from the federal perspective, how can we move them into SSDI? How can we move them into other programs to make up for the lost income that they would have gotten um, if they hadn't, if the uh, Congress had not changed uh, the welfare programs federally? So like, just what what impression are you left with uh, in terms of the federal government and how it can address these problems uh, and how it can even fix its own attempts to fix these problems when they all start piling up a mile high of different, you know, three letter or four letter acronyms of all the different ways we're trying to help people that all want to command it from Washington, D.C. out to the rest of the country? Well, I went into this as a decentralizer on a philosophical basis, I came out of it as a decentralizer on both a philosophical and a pragmatic basis. The centralized approach uh, just doesn't work. Um, no matter no matter how you slice it, uh, during the Bush administration starting in 2001, uh, there were different impulses competing. There were some decentralists, there were a lot of centralizers. Essentially, the centralizers won. And the idea was that you were going to uh, decide where the money should go. The people in Washington would decide where the money should go purely on a, on, a, on a basis of social science. They were going to keep careful statistics on what worked and what didn't work. They were going to have study programs. And then they would know 
where the money should go. Uh, it didn't. It didn't work that way. Number one, uh, the the testing that you can do in some of the academic articles that are written are just are just full of holes, and anyone with practical experience can see that. Uh, number two, the people, and this this I can say almost across the board. Uh, there are some programs, individual local programs, where which uh, do not proceed on a good basis and where there's corruption. But for the most part, those local programs work so much better than the federally determined programs. People in their local communities know who's doing a good job and who's not uh, much more than someone sitting in an office in Washington knows. And so that just led me more and more, both on a basis of philosophy and also experience, to say, let's decentralize. Let's not have the people in Washington make the decisions. Uh, can we do it at this point with, uh, with, without getting the government involved at all? I suspect we are so trained at this point to wait and let the government people do it that uh, a, a system where there are tax credits rather than just... Uh, uh, the, the tax credits certainly work better than the government deciding. Can you do it without some mechanism whereby people have more money to contribute and maybe more time to contribute to the local programs than they do now. I think you need something of that sort. And that's why 25 years ago, I was a strong advocate of tax credits and still am. I would hope there's a comeback, although in the present Washington mood, I don't see it happening. But that's where I am philosophically and practically based on that uh, interesting and educational uh, fantasy camp that I was involved in for a few years. So this uh, kind of centralized planning idea, or you, know, you call it scientism, or uh, just kind of follow the facts, do you think that's what dominates the current conversation in Washington, or is it just kind of chaos right now as far as anything policy-wise is concerned, or do you think that's the kind of what has won and continues to dominate? Well, my my impression is that it's chaotic, uh, but I'm just I'm just analyzing that, looking at it from afar. Uh, I'm not deeply, intimately involved in it anymore. But uh, if I had to generalize, I'd say that in a way we've moved from uh, compassionate conservatism, uh, rightly understood, which is decentralist rather than centralist, we've moved from compassionate conservatism to, in a sense, I suppose you could call it cruel conservatism, uh, that namely there's not a whole lot of uh, interest and uh, uh not not a whole lot of interest, not a lot of pressure to try to set up programs that will really help the poor. The programs that are going still keep going. There is, in a sense, a poverty industrial complex that keeps things moving pretty much the way they have been moving and not very effectively. But there are a lot of people uh, whose jobs are at stake uh, in terms of taking money that comes in and, and spending it in some way that purportedly will help. Uh, they keep doing the same old, same old. It doesn't work. They do more of it. And there just doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in, uh, at least among uh, Republicans and most Democrats that I know of, to to do things that will really help people in communities. Yeah, so much of Washington is wanting to be seen to be doing something, even if you're not right. actually doing something. And your, your point about it being mostly chaos I mean, from, again, I don't live in D.C. I'm in touch with a lot of people in D.C. And I come back all the time to... Kristen Soltis Anderson, the pollster, had a really great line on understanding Washington. She's like, you know, when I moved to Washington, D.C., I moved there hoping that it would be the West Wing. Everybody told me that it would be House of Cards. It's actually Veep. It is, if you've seen the TV show Veep, it is people who are venal and self-interested, pretending like they're in control of things when they're really not in control of many events, but they're trying to posture as if they are. You know, Marvin, you touched on compassionate conservatism there. Um, I want you to comment on that, if you can, from two perspectives. And one, I part, one part of this I asked very selfishly. Um, what do you think was the, the, the impact of compassionate conservatism, again, rightly understood? Do you think that it was successful beyond, I think, one of the things you hint at in your piece, which was it was successful... Uh, to an extent for George W. Bush in his 99-2000 presidential race and, and you know, in, in as much as he defined himself as a compassionate conservative. conservative. And he won. Um, and he won an election that, you know, 
political analysts will tell you he probably had no business whatsoever winning in 2000. But also look at it from a, uh, you know, I'm a marketing guy, from a branding perspective. Um, one of the complaints I've heard about compassionate conservatism as a brand is like, you know, what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that conservatives weren't in a way compassionate before that? Was it a need to set people separate from what came before them? Um, which I guess is possible because I always I, I like to come back to the quote from um, Henry David Thoreau that there's a, always a certain meanness in the argument of conservatism joined with a certain superiority in its fact. Uh, I, I think that very well may describe um, a lot of conservatives prior to the compassionate conservatism days of the early 2000s and certainly a lot of them since. So from a a policy perspective, um, do you think it was successful? Did it resonate with people? And from a branding perspective, what do you think was the effect of having George W. Bush and then his efforts, faith-based faith initiatives and all of that, set apart from the rest of movement conservatism that had come before it? Yeah. No, it, it politically worked uh, for George W. Bush. Uh, he actually won a, uh, a majority of votes uh, in 2004, which is the last time I think that's happened with a Republican candidate. Mm -hmm. That is a majority of actual votes, uh, as well as winning the majority of the Electoral College. Uh, so it worked politically. The, uh, the brand uh, was tarnished because uh, George W. Bush, uh, in some ways, pushed to do this by the need to have Democrats vote for uh, appropriations for the for the war in Iraq, which is problematical in itself, uh, he had to allow for more domestic spending, and so compassionate conservatism became mixed up in kind of big spending. Well, this is a this is another big government spending program, and that's how we show we're compassionate by spending money. Um, I don't, I don't. I don't think Bush went into it thinking that was the case. But then again, he also didn't go into it thinking that on 9/11, uh, his administration would be turned into a into a war foreign policy administration. What did change, to some extent, in the, among Republicans, at least briefly, was the, was the rhetoric. Up until um, the mid 90s, a typical Republican speech about welfare would would have some reference to welfare queens. That is about. Uh, people uh, just taking in money and spending it badly, uh, taking in money and and spending it to to uh, uh, for for drugs and alcohol, or for this or that, but not really uh, for any useful purpose. Not helping their families in the process, uh, taking money in a way illegitimately, and so welfare was seen as a financial problem, a spending program, a spending problem. Um, what I tried to suggest, and yes, there you you could find uh, examples of people misusing it, but for the most part, as I actually tried to do some uh, street level research rather than just relying on on uh, on sweet level generalizations, that a lot of the people who were getting welfare, particularly a lot of single moms, uh, were really trying hard to help themselves and their and their children. Uh, and for a whole lot of reasons, they were in a very difficult situation. And the real problem with welfare was not that we were spending too much money on it. This was uh, a rich society. We could afford to do that, but uh, that we were too cheap uh, in what people really needed, namely challenging personal and spiritual help. That wasn't offered. Uh, we, we just talked in terms of money. We didn't talk in terms of person-to-person -person involvement. So what, what what passed as compassion was not really compassion. You look at the word compassion, and I tried to be a little bit of an educator on that, uh, compassion with suffering, that is personally coming alongside people in need, helping them uh, often on a one-to-one -one basis uh, and seeing their needs and then trying to, trying to help them get jobs, to get education, to finish high school, uh, to be able to um, uh, be encouraged to get married and, and all the differences that that makes. So looking at individuals on a personal basis rather than just looking at them almost as, well, I have I have a dog whom I love. I like to take care of my dog. I put some food in his bowl in the morning. I take him on walks. Uh, I pet him. That in some ways is the way that 
more affluent people tended to treat poor people uh, in a benevolent way as pets, uh, in a in a critical way as as nuisances and pests, but not as human beings made in God's image and capable of doing a lot more than we were asking them to do. One of the uh, kind of programs going forward that you highlight as you know in need of some help or uh, reform is the SSI. So you know welfare for those with severe disabilities. What would a program look like uh, that going forward could actually bring hope and focus on some of these, the actual abilities that uh, these people have as opposed to just a kind of looking at their disabilities or their shortcomings? There are, there are physical disabilities and there are psychological disabilities. I mean, the physical disabilities first, you, you want to ask, what can you do? Uh, not just not just what do you what do you say you need, but what can you do? And people are disabled physically to a vast variety of, of in different ways. Some people aren't aren't able to do anything. They're just they well you you know I don't have to go into details here. They just they just can't. Other people can get some types of jobs. Maybe they're not physically able to do things, but they're mentally uh, and psychologically stable. Uh, they can help in a lot of different ways. So how can those people, instead of just putting them on the disabled list and keeping them on that list year after year, how can they be helped to be as much as they can be, do as much as they can do? Uh, then you come to the whole question of, of psychological disabilities, and there it gets to be uh, not only strange at times, but sad and tragic, because you extend that to kids, and there are some families, and there, this has been documented even by liberal newspapers like the Boston Globe, where I used to work a long time ago, which actually, uh, because there's money to be made, uh, get their kids labeled as 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 disabled. Let get get their kids labeled as intellectually and psychologically unable to do anything. Uh, and and children change, children progress, uh, and you get to this really sad situation where kids are labeled as disabled. Uh, they're not really trained to do much. They're not educated to do much. And then, nevertheless, when they can do stuff, they're they're in a situation. Well, if I actually go and get a job that I could get, then uh, we won't get this money anymore from the government. Uh, my mom says we need that money uh, uh, rather than my working at a minimum wage job and then being able to work my way up. So you you get into a situation where some kids who could do much more are labeled as permanently disabled, and it just goes on and on and on. So. Uh, it's it's a it's a really sad situation that often we get into. And again, the difference between, in a sense, uh, compassionate conservatism rightly understood and cruel conservatism is that uh, cruel conservatives, like cruel liberals, sometimes uh, uh, treat people as less than human. Sometimes make fun of people. Sometimes scorn people. Uh, that's not helpful. It's not helpful personally. It's not helpful spiritually. It's not helpful politically. Uh, but there's a tendency to do that, and and I will say, just uh, uh, just in passing here, that that uh, we we had a president of the United States, Donald Trump, who would actually make fun of people who were who were disabled. That wasn't helpful, uh, and and hopefully Republicans uh, won't won't keep encouraging that. Well, this is a good reminder and what you said there, too, of just how much incentives matter. And I know a huge problem with a lot of the federal welfare programs is the you know, you, we want to be able to have people get the help that they need in the time that they need it, but we want them to be able to move off of it and move on. And I know a major concern among the, that constituency is once you get off of some of these programs, the amount of work that goes into if you need it again, getting back on it is incredibly difficult. So it's a, you know, a good reminder, too, of the limitations of how well we think we can plan these things and a testament to, Marvin, what you were talking about with the subsidiarity approach to this of, of helping the organizations and the people who are closest to those in need rather than dictating it from, from Washington, D.C., I want to ask you with what you've said, too, about, you know, kind of the Republican Party. What do you make of, you know, I, I follow what you're saying about, you know, cruel conservatism as a uh, contrast to rightly understood compassionate conservatism. You also have this reorientation going on now, and, and maybe this will help us dovetail into our second topic, 
um, of a Republican Party that wants to see that political party remade as a multi-ethnic working class party. They're now more concerned about the middle class and lower, you know, uh, lower middle class, working class people, or at least are speaking with the pretense of having concern for those people. I, I have my suspicions about it, which will be reflected in the second story that we get to. Um, what do you make of – so now we get a lot of concern for, say, poverty in Appalachia, uh, where you know, SSDI and is a huge, uh, a huge issue in those areas. Um, do you think that this is an evolution perhaps out – of the cruel conservatism that you were describing, or what do you what do you make of um, the concern of at least some elected officials within the Republican Party now having this reorientation away from the entrepreneurs, uh, the business owners side of things that I think we could fairly say Mitt Romney as a 2012 nominee was associated with. That's the side that they were on. To now wanting to be seen on the side of of workers, even to the the extent of, you know, J.D. Vance from Ohio is um, saying he's in solidarity with the United Auto Workers who are on strike. There's the possibility that former President Trump running for president again um, may go and uh, and speak to them. Uh, what, what do you make of this moment and this reorientation of the Republican Party? Well, I'm, I'm for some of that. Uh, uh, I don't think it's a choice we need to make between uh, caring about the middle class and caring about uh, the the poorer people, poorer than middle class. Uh, I suppose you could say lower class in certain ways. Um, the there for now, for example, on a, on a racial basis, for a long time in the South, uh, starting from the end of Reconstruction all the way up until the 1960s, uh, one of the ways in which um, lower class white workers were kept in line was by saying, well, uh, you are better than these people, namely black people. Uh, so the, there was a certain racist appeal uh, to try to break up, let's say, a, a coalition of uh, poor whites and poorer blacks. Uh, that's that was a political tactic that worked for a long time. I kind of see that same sort of tactic going on right now. Uh, we we on on the part of some Republicans, we are going to appeal to the lower middle class uh, and develop policies that benefit them, which could be helpful. But we're going to beat up on the people poorer than them, uh, namely uh, homeless people, uh, namely uh, people trying to get into the United States. Uh, we're going to declare those people are the enemies, and uh, we will we will have an alliance basically of uh, the interest of rich people and the interest of middle class people against the lower class. Um, I don't like to I don't like to talk in class terms like that. I think there are many more important things that are going on, but politically I do see that happening now. And uh, uh, much as I as I like that pivot in the Republican Party to to think more about the lower middle class, I don't think we should be doing it. Uh, by uh, ripping the people below that. Well, so maybe this is a good point, and we can continue to return to Marvin's essay, but this, I think it'd be a good point to introduce our, our second topic, uh, which was this legislation proposed by uh, Senator Josh Hawley, Republican from Missouri, uh, certainly one of the people in that uh, group of Republicans I described in the last question. And this Legislation, which he's entitled the Capping Credit Card Interest Rates Act, uh, which he introduced on September 12th, um, would limit APR, the people play, pay on their credit cards, to 18 percent. And he's billing this as a plan to help working people, working Americans, um, which to me, I'll let both of you chime in on this as well, of course, um, this is a perfect example of the kind of thing that is being presented to people as a way to help them, but actually has a whole – will have a whole host of incredibly obvious un quote unquote unintended consequences. I, I don't think Josh Hawley intends these. I, I, I vacillate between whether thinking he's mendacious or just foolish. Um, but 
what he will succeed in doing if this legislation were to become law. And it doesn't have very much of a chance to become law. But if it were to be enacted, capping APR at 18 percent would have the effect of if you have people who have poor credit, bad credit, who are trying to reestablish their credit worthiness of making it much more difficult for them to do it. It is, a, to me, a perfect example of the kind of thing that is being done in the name of helping people who are going to be most harmed by that kind of legislation. And, you know, for us here at Acton, um, this is a perfect example of, of a kind of our tagline in practice, right? Connecting good intentions, helping people like the kind that Josh Hawley wants to help is a good thing. With good, e- with sound economics, and this, the economics to me of this kind of proposal are just wrong and off, and are going to have deleterious effects that he's either aware of and doesn't care for political branding purposes, or he's not aware of. In which case, someone needs to make him aware of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, interest rates are going to be a product of the risk that is uh, assumed by the, the creditor. So. This is going to make certain people unable uh, to get credit cards, which is you know going to be a problem, like you said, for those who are trying to reestablish credit. I also think there's kind of a cultural angle or something that we should consider that it would make uh, assuming more credit card debt relatively uh, more uh, likely for for some people. So we have to talk about the spending side of this, which to help uh, the middle class and lower middle class. Uh, get out of credit card debt, or get out of debt, it's not to encourage them to get more debt, but to talk about, okay, how can we reduce our spending and what are other pathways of acquiring wealth in the economy? So that's, I think, a better conversation to have if you really want to help people here. Yeah, I think both of you, uh, your, your points are good. And in some ways, there's there's a, a lot of, say, middle-class ignorance about what happens to poor people as far as getting credit and getting money in some ways. Uh, there are these things called pawn shops. Uh, there are payday loans. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, non-official types of lending that goes on with interest rates uh, in practice of 100% or 200%. And yeah, if you if you get rid of uh, of if you if you cap interest rates in that way, yeah, that can work for a lot of middle class people. It's actually going to hurt a lot of poor people because they will be doing things that hurt them economically. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, good intentions, bad results, I suspect. Yeah, I'd written a piece, actually, I, I pulled up here and we'll put in the show notes. Uh, Marvin, you just reminded me of that, you know, I, I I enjoyed this, especially back in this period of time in my life of, you know, writing the, uh, defending the thing that nobody wants to defend. Uh, and I wrote a piece in 2015 for Foundation for Economic Education, defending payday loans. Um, which were under assault at the time, largely from the left, but also from um, HBO's John Oliver and uh, another comedian, Sarah Silverman, which I always find kind of funny because they are, uh, you know, they are among the people least likely to ever need to interact with a payday loan facility. Uh, and I can understand, like, look, it is credit card APR. Payday loans are exactly the kind of thing that is easy to inveigh against because the interest that is charged to those people for those kinds of loans or credit cards um, seems to be excessive to a lot of people. And it seems like they're taking advantage of them. And certainly one can misuse both credit cards and payday loans to the point of it being injurious. However, one needs to always ask the question, what are the alternatives? And for a lot of people, the alternative to a a payday loan is not just magically having the money that they need in the time that they need it. Um, The alternative would be that they wouldn't be able to access it. You might have a number of bounced checks. You're going to have fees associated with those bounced checks. Um, So it is, again, the kind of thing that you know, people should be fully aware of the risks of. But for people in a position that can't access credit at lower interest rates because their credit isn't what they would want it to be, it it could be helpful if not necessary for those people. But because it's so easy in a populist vein to inveigh against them, um, they come under fire and they need, you know, people 
uh, in my own small way, willing to defend things that nobody wants to defend, but do serve a purpose. These things don't exist for no reason. They exist because they serve a purpose. And just because most people can't relate to it doesn't mean that it doesn't serve a purpose for people who need access to that kind of short term money or need access to credit if they're trying to rebuild their credit. Yeah, maybe we need full employment for guys who will break your leg. <laughs> you don't pay it back. I, exactly. Uh, wh why don't we move now to our, our third topic, which Noah, um, you had discovered and flagged for us, uh, which does, I think, fit perfectly in with the conversation we've been having with Marvin about his essay in The Fall, Religion and Liberty, uh, this study out of Canada that if one were to read the headlines about this, and this is a good reminder too, I imagine, you know, Marvin, particularly with, you know, your expertise in these areas, it's a good reminder to people that when, when you're reading news articles, if you've ever had this experience, read a news article on a topic that you know a lot about. And the first thing you'll be able to do is catalog all the ways that the reporter got something, got things wrong about it. And, and the kind of things that you know, because you have a wealth of knowledge on one specific topic. And then a lot of people move on and read an article on something they know very little about and just assume everything that they are reading is true. The The headlines covering the story are a good example of that, of um, it, many headlines claiming this study shows something that uh, I don't think that it actually shows. So Noah, why don't, why don't you tell us what the study is that you found and what the implications of it are? Yeah, so the study is purportedly trying to answer the question of would direct unconditional cash transfers help uh, homeless people, uh, you know, get out of homelessness and, and kind of move forward with their lives. So it's out of, uh, it was the study was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's the study was done in Canada. So they gave people um, $7,500 uh, directly a, as a part of this study, and then they studied them over a year and, and tracked them. And so of the people who were in the study, they found um, le they spent less time uh, on the streets, and they did not spend more money on drugs and alcohol. So this is what all the kind of... Uh, outlets have picked up is this that top line story. Now there's kind of a major problem with that narrative because as they chose the people for this study, they A, uh, took out anyone from the study who had any history of drug or alcohol abuse. So that was about a third of the original group that they had that they, they took out. And then they took out anyone who had been homeless for more than two years. So you think of anyone who kind of has a more longer-term history or um, deeper problems that they've been dealing with, that's going to be the group that they also took out. So that's another third. Um, and then, uh, Marvin, you can tell a little bit more about after that. There was even more problems with the study, um, but they uh, – also had a problem even just tracking people. So they ended up just giving uh, cash transfers to just 50 people. And then this is the group that they then we see the headlines about. So I think it's a very oversimplified story and potentially a study that's just designed to create a certain outcome. Yeah, you, you start out with 732 participants from certain shelters. Uh, they have to have been homeless for less than two years. Uh, non-severe levels of substance use or alcohol use or no mental health problems, um, which means you are you are right from the start in your sample, uh, leaving out most homeless people. If you look at all the problems of alcoholism and addiction and mental health and so forth, uh, they're in these shelters anyway, which a lot of people who are sleeping rough, as they say, are not. So you start out with 732, you eventually get down to 50, you actually get the money. So Basically, what the study shows or proves is that one out of 15 people uh, from the population that has the less severe problems, one out of 15, if you give those people a bunch of money, that one out of 15, then those people will, for a short time, do better than people who uh, aren't among that small part of the homeless population. Uh, and the study itself says, but uh, I'm not sure that any of the news stories that you've, that you've seen uh, would include this. The study itself says our results may not extend to people who are chronically homeless, 
or experience higher severity of substance use, alcohol use, or psychiatric symptoms. So the study itself, if you read along, in a sense, read the fine print, uh, doesn't say what, what newspaper stories for the most part have been saying that it does say. Doesn't prove anything except that maybe one out of 15 people from a pre-selected population will do better if you give them a bunch of money. This is a good point to remember, too. I would encourage people, whenever they read news stories, and again, I'll give you some of the headlines uh, here that we were, were pulling just before we started taping the program today. Um, from The Guardian, Canada study debunks stereotypes of homeless people's spending habits. Uh, from the CBC, uh, research project gave homeless people 7,500 each. The results were beautifully surprising. I hate that kind of headline writing. Uh, Washington Post, cash transfers reduce homelessness, uh, raising savings, Canada study says. Uh, Vancouver Sun, give homeless people cash, they spend it on housing, UBC study finds. I encourage people anytime that they see one of these headlines, one of these news stories that says, you know, a study found this, to read it, pause, and ask yourself the question, what if that were true? Because in a lot of cases, when you drill down into what these studies actually show, the takeaway in news articles is not reflective of what it actually shows. These are often stories that are being written by somebody younger with limited experience who read the summary of it and drew the conclusions that they wanted to draw from it rather than what's in there. There's also a huge problem, to, as I understand it, within this kind of literature that a lot of these studies – it is, you know, what you would want from studies like this is somebody does it, they find a result, and then you want somebody to replicate the study and see if they get a similar result to that. And a lot of these studies have either not been replicated or are unreplicable. They are not able to be repeated. Uh, so I would caution people on these kinds of stories in particular that – Frequently, they do not show what the flashy news headlines will want to indicate that they show. Yeah, the other problem kind of at the heart of this study or a, you know, assumption that's made is how do you sort people into would benefit from cash transfer or would not benefit from cash transfer? So for this study, they had a blind survey where people self-reported whether they had a history of – uh, drug abuse or if they had or how long they were homeless. And so and they didn't know that this was going to be the answer to this question is going to decide whether you get $7,500. So if you rolled this out in the real world, you couldn't break up these groups in the same way that they did. So even saying cash transfers helps small subset of homeless population isn't really accurate because you can't sort them the way they did in the study. Yeah. The other thing that's difficult about about these studies is uh, how long can you keep them going? Uh, I've, I've sometimes tried to track people I had uh, met with, uh, interviewed in homeless shelters, and um, uh, the the organizations just lose track of them. And even even the even organizations that really try hard, you know, people move, people do this, people do that. Uh, so typically, you'll have a study that might show. If it were a good study, it might show, oh, here's what here's what these people are doing after a year. But the real question is what happens after three years or five years or 10 years? And I don't see studies that actually do that. Uh, so there, even the good studies aren't worth very much. And most of the studies that I've seen are studies that are uh, distorted by sampling and then further distorted when reporters, as you say, take a quick look and don't read the fine print. Marvin, let me ask you this. There's, I think, more people from some unexpected places in, in recent years. I'm in particular thinking of Charles Murray at uh, AEI as an advocate, uh, at least in a limited way for this idea, uh, which I think also comes to or slightly out of an observation, Marvin, that you made earlier and that's also reflected in your essay that, you know, in the 90s, we addressed – as a country, welfare in this one big top line program. And as you noted, there are 80 or 90 other programs 
uh, when you go down the list that were untouched by all of that. And I remember Milton Friedman making the argument that, you know, the a better way of doing it, at least by his lights, would be to take the total amount of money that is being spent in all of those programs in combination and to, again, just kind of do something similar to what this study was talking about, which is just give cash to people. I think you've heard Charles Murray at AEI become more of an advocate for the idea of some form of a UBI, a universal basic income. Um, I hear it often from those voices cast in a way of, you know, again, looking at what the alternatives are. Would you rather have these 90 to 100 federal programs all administrated by bureaucratic agencies in Washington, D.C.? Or if you just accept the proposition that we're going to spend all of this money on in the name of poverty alleviation, of helping people who need it, would it not just be better – to reduce that size of that bureaucracy and just create one agency whose primary and really primary and only goal is to cut checks to people. Is there anything, Marvin, that you find interesting about uh, the you know this idea coming into vogue in the last few years, at, if only as an alternative to the current construction of welfare programs? Yeah, I do find that interesting. The uh, current programs, even the best of the programs, most of the money spent on those programs doesn't get to poor people. Uh, you are hiring a, a, a lot of people with, with very good intentions uh, uh, from the social work community and others, and you are paying them. So there are a lot of middle class jobs that are at stake here. Uh, and that's where most most money within welfare programs goes to. So, yeah, I am I am interested in the idea of just, in a sense, cutting out the, the middleman or the middlewoman. Although, you know, there is a question, again, of what you do with those people at this point. <clears throat> but I can see that the uh, problem with that in some ways, if you just do it in a broad approach, is that uh, different parts of that population have different programs. Money going to single men who are long-term homeless, uh, most of that money does go uh, to uh, drugs or alcohol. Do you want to subsidize that? If we're going to go that route, I would much rather have a program targeted to how do we help children? Uh, what are the best ways to do that and make sure that they they are uh, fed and clothed and housed? What can we do there? Uh, and I think there are some possibilities there, but it's difficult. You want to help those kids in a way that also encourages marriage, because that's, uh, as a number of researchers have have found, I mean, that's really the the long-term thing that works much better. Uh, two adults being much better than one in trying to help a kid. Uh, so how can you do that without encouraging more single parenthood? It's a difficult question, but I'm, I'm way open to uh, things that would help kids and help build strong marriages. Yeah, my worry about that, uh, the conversation around direct cash transfers or UBI, whatever you want to call it, is that even in a kind of pie-in-the-sky world where you get to remove everything and put a UBI in, then I think you end up adding all of the other programs that help specific targeted groups one by one. You just add them back mm -hmm. in one by one. Add one to help people with disabilities, one to help people with mental health issues, one to help children, right? You just add them all back in. So I worry that that, that conversation, along with the study and everything, just tends to be a distraction from okay, if we're actually going to think about the homelessness crisis and how to help people, we need to think about the mental health crisis, we need to think about substance abuse crisis, and we need to think about the housing uh, market. So, so instead, we kind of distract ourselves looking at this, this other thing. So that's maybe the real harm of some of, uh, some of that conversation. Yeah, I, I'm also reminded of, and I want to adapt a little bit from the great Mencken quote, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. Um, for every one of these complex problems, there is an answer that I think is clear, simple, and I, I would say in this case, right is the wrong word to use, but, you know, at, at least worth trying, but just impossible to enact, just impossible to actually get done. I mean, the the kind of – the problem with talking about grand bargains from a political sense is to the average person, you can convince them that they make sense, right? I, to move it out of the realm of conversation we've just been having, you know, how do we fix and try to assuage everyone's concerns on 
both sides of the political aisle about the way that we conduct elections. And you can come up with these proposals like, you know, OK, let's limit mail and absentee voting and early voting. But in exchange for getting rid of these programs that take voting and move them from Election Day to two months before Election Day all the way through and say, well, we'll we'll come up with a compromise and we'll make uh, Election Day a federal holiday or we'll move it over a weekend. Right. So you've got three ways to do it is that it's the kind of thing that you could get. I think a lot of people to agree with, but getting it actually into legislation and getting the political constituencies in Washington that would need to agree on something like that, that's when it enters the realm of the pretty much impossible. To bring it back to UBI, I, I understand the concern of a lot of people that if you know, it's great to propose it from the frame of we take – the hundred or so current programs and we scrap them and the bureaucracy that goes along with them and we just enact this one program that just sends checks out to everyone. Clear, simple, easy to understand. And I don't even necessarily know that it's wrong to go back to the Mencken quote, but getting people to agree on that, the ones that actually have to put votes behind it, strikes me as the kind of thing that's just if not impossible, exceedingly unlikely, and that we are going to probably get it more in the form of if we got everyone to agree on a, a, some kind of a universal basic income, it would be on top of these programs, not in replacement of all of them. And in that sense, we would probably compound the problem rather than trying to really do something about it. Yeah, I suspect you're right. The, the uh, a fundamental thing to keep in mind is who knows best what people in a local community need. Back in the 90s, when I was Marvin Appleseed and trying to plan things, I would sometimes be speaking at, to various groups. And the question I would say is, if you had $500 that you could spend any way you want, that would that in your in your understanding would most help the poor, how many of you would send it to Washington? And no one raises hands. How many of you would send it to state capital? No one. How many of you would send it to City Hall? Maybe two or three people out of several hundred. How many of you think, how many of you know of a local group in your community that you think does a better job than local, state, or federal governmental authorities? And just but everyone raises hands. Now, in reality, how would that work out? There'd be some money that would be misspent. Uh, there's a lot of money misspent now, I think would be better off with that type of thing than any kind of centralized program. So that, to me, is the key question to keep in mind. How can we decentralize as opposed to more centralization? Um, and I'm, I'm open to, to all kinds of things, but uh, I uh, am feeling a, a little bit skeptical about anything coming out of Washington these days. Why don't we call it a wrap there? Uh, Marvin's essay, The Thrill and Chill, of Compassionate Conservatism is the feature essay in the fall issue of Religion and Liberty, which will be on newsstands at Barnes & Noble and Books a Million stores soon. Uh, but it is published online today at acton.org, and we will put a link to that in the show notes. We'll also put a link in the show notes to where you can subscribe to the magazine Religion and Liberty. Uh, that's acton.org slash subscriptions for $29.99 a year. Uh, you get four issues of this beautiful magazine in your mailbox. You get it mailed to you. So those of you who are already subscribers, the issue with Marvin's essay will be coming to your mailbox in the next week or two. But if you want to start getting the magazine, and we highly encourage you to do so, uh, visit that link in the show notes or acton.org slash subscriptions, $29.99 for four issues. We really think that you'll enjoy it, and we encourage you to check it out. Thank you for listening to Acton Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look in the show notes for a link where you can subscribe directly to Acton Unwind, or you can just search Acton Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us, five-star reviews only on Apple Podcasts, so that more people can find our show. Thanks to Noah, and a very special thanks to Marvin Alasky. For the Acton Institute, I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week.